ABC News Live. A constitutional crisis in Peru, where Congress removed the president from office with a vote to replace him with the country's vice president. Amid the impeachment, protests and unrest break out in the capital of Lima. And in Germany, a far-right extremist group is accused of a coup attempt, a terror plot to overthrow the government. At least 25 people arrested in raids across the country. Tonight, what we know about those taken into custody. Supreme Court justices hearing another blockbuster case. This one could give state legislatures power to say when, where, and how Americans vote for president and for Congress. Georgia has spoken. Democrats clinch a major win as Senator Raphael Warnock returns to D.C. after defeating Herschel Walker. Warnock's victory gives his party a 51 to 49 edge over Senate Republicans. Now we look ahead to 2024 as President Biden calls to congratulate Senator Warnock what this means for the president and his agenda. Rachel Scott is in the Capitol tonight keeping your online privacy protected. As companies gather information and curate ads, Congress is working towards comprehensive national rules to stop sharing intimate details for you and your family. Are you aware that, that, that these companies are picking up on where you're going and what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think one time I looked up like the word it for like whatever, and I started getting horror movie ads and I was so freaked out. Like, I just could not take it. Inside the final nine months of America's decades-long war in Afghanistan, a new documentary captures the chaos inside the country as the U.S. withdraws, giving us a clear picture of the pain war wages on the people. Our conversation with the award-winning director of Retrograde. To me, the value of documentary film is to instigate conversation, is to create dialogue, is to allow people from all different sides of the political spectrum to come and you and debate and to feel and to care. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ariel Reshef in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Tonight, we are following a thwarted coup attempt in Europe and an ousted president in South America. But we begin here tonight at home with a case the Supreme Court heard today that some say is a direct threat to our democracy and how we vote. The nine justices heard an unprecedented bid to upend election laws and give state legislatures nearly unchecked power to dictate when, where, and how Americans vote for president and for Congress. This comes as the 2022 election season is officially behind us. Voters in Georgia electing Raphael Warnock and gave Democrats a 51st seat in the Senate. Georgia's Secretary of State said the runoff broke turnout records for a midterm year. But tonight, there are serious questions about how this Supreme Court case could ultimately impact the 2024 election. Let's get right to ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran, who is outside the Supreme Court for us tonight. And Terry, walk us through this case, what it means, and why it could have a huge impact on the way federal elections are held. Well, Ariel, you said it. This is the biggest election case in decades because it deals with that fundamental question. Who should have the power to decide how our federal elections are run? It comes out of North Carolina where legislators uh, are suing to overturn a state Supreme Court decision. The state Supreme Court is controlled by Democrats that struck down a redistricting, con congressional redistricting plan passed by the Republicans. So Republicans are coming to the court and saying, look at the Constitution. In the Constitution, it says that elections shall be decided the time, place, and manner of elections, how elections should be decided, or, or how elections should be run, should be decided by the state legislatures. And the Republicans in this case are saying that means only the state legislatures. Unchecked by a, a governor's veto, state Supreme Courts, even the state constitution. They want elected politicians in the state legislatures alone to control who and how, how the federal elections are run. So you can get a sense of the, of the huge change that would work in our system, which has full of checks and balances and separation of powers. All that would be gone, and only the state legislatures would decide how elections are run and who wins if there's election disputes. Okay, so Terry, let's take a listen to some of what played out inside the Supreme Court today. I guess what I don't understand is how you can cut 
the state constitution out of the equation when it is giving the state legislature the authority to exercise leg legislative power. Do you think that it furthers democracy to transfer the political controversy about districting from the legislature to elected Supreme Courts? This is a proposal that gets rid of the normal checks and balances on the way um, big <coughs> governmental decisions are made in this country. And, and you might think that it gets rid of all those checks and balances at exactly the time when they are needed most. Okay, Terry, after following those arguments, did you get a sense of how the justices might rule here? Well, you could hear in those bites, couldn't you, that the liberals are really concerned. You could hear the alarm sometimes, especially from Justice Kagan. How can you have unchecked power over our elections in just one place? The state legislatures. State legislatures in normal days on every other issue are encompassed in a state constitution that sets the laws and authorizes what they can do. State Supreme Courts that reviews those laws. The governor can veto them. How can you take that out and just give the state legislators the themselves the power to run elections. The conservatives are saying, well, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Judges can be partisan, too. This is what the plain text of the Constitution says. And so that's the conflict. However, there were several justices, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, maybe Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who seem to be looking for a middle ground, who seem to be saying, OK, what the North Carolina Supreme Court, controlled by Democrats here, did might be too far but maybe we don't want to go the whole way. But that is a difficult line to draw. And really, the risks are very considerable here. If you get the state Supreme Courts and state constitutions out of the equation, all kinds of things like early voting and same-day registration that are found in those parts of our laws could be under chunk, could be gone. Uh, it, is a, it is a case with consequences really beyond imagining. Somebody said the blast radius from this theory would have the Supreme Court in session eternally trying to sort it out. Far-reaching consequences, and you are following it all for us. Terry Moran at the U.S. Supreme Court, thank you. And we will have to wait and see how the Supreme Court handles that case. But we are finally turning the page on the 2022 midterm election cycle. Incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock defeating Republican challenger Herschel Walker last night in the Georgia Senate runoff that's being seen as a major victory for Democrats and a stunning rebuke of former President Trump's influence. Many now wondering if his grip on the party is waning. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott reporting tonight from Capitol Hill. Senator, how are you feeling? Good, how are you? Senator Raphael Warnock arriving back in Washington today after voters in Georgia sent a clear message. It, it is my honor to utter the four most powerful words ever spoken in a democracy. The people have spoken. Democrats taking a victory lap. Did it again. After one year, 10 months and 17 days of the longest 50-50 Senate in history, 51, yeah. a slim majority. That is great, and we are so happy about it. President Biden, now the first Democratic president in nearly 90 years, the first since FDR, whose party did not lose a single Senate seat in a midterm election. Congratulations, buddy. Thank you. You'll get it. Sure, I will. I guarantee you it will. For Republicans, Herschel Walker's loss, a bitter pill to swallow. And I'm not going to make any excuses now because we put up one heck of a fight. Walker underperformed in Georgia's Republican strongholds. His campaign plagued with one scandal after another. The football legend, the hand-picked choice of former President Donald Trump. Trump endorsed Senate candidates in Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Arizona, and Nevada all went down in defeat this year. Republican leaders increasingly frustrated. In the election year when it should have been a referendum on the current administration, their policies, uh, the Democrats in many cases were able to kind of turn it into a choice election because of, of uh, Trump's presence out there. So, uh, you know, was he a factor? Um, I don't think there's any question about that. Despite loss after loss for his candidates, Trump is now doubling down on the fringe having dinner with anti-Semitic rapper Kanye West and white supremacist Nick Fuentes, even calling for parts of the Constitution to be terminated to overturn the 2020 election. And now ABC has learned that just last night, Trump welcomed some followers of the QAnon conspiracy theory to Mar-a-Lago. You are incredible people. 
to some Republicans, it all spells one thing. And I know a lot of people in our party uh, love the president, former president, but he's, uh, if you will, the kiss of death for somebody who wants to win a general election. ABC congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins me now. And Rachel, earlier this year, we heard Republican leader Mitch McConnell warn about candidate quality, and that does seem to have been a major factor in this final defeat for Republicans. It really does, Ariel, especially the way that you look at the way that these midterm election losses for Republicans are just stacking up here, especially when it comes to the ones that former President Donald Trump endorsed, including Herschel Walker. And I got to tell you, I've spent a lot of time traveling this country, uh, covering this midterm election cycle, just got back from Georgia, and the voters that I spoke to, even voters that voted for the Republican governor, Brian Kemp, told me that they just could not vote for Herschel Walker. They said, repeating those words from McConnell, that this all came Came down to candidate quality for them. Ariel? Tracking it all for us. Rachel Scott, thank you so much. Political director Rick Klein joins us now. And Rick, let's talk big picture here about the implications of Warnock's win. Tonight, Democrats still basking in that victory, and Republicans may be starting to do a bit of soul searching, some introspection. Yeah, and if you look at the way that, that Raphael Warnock was able to win, it tells you exactly what the problem is with some Republican candidates like Herschel Walker. Warnock won in that first round by about 40,000 votes. He's looking like he'll finish about 100,000 votes up. He drove up big numbers in Atlanta and the suburbs and almost everywhere in the state. You saw his vote total a little bit higher than it was in the first round, which suggests very strongly that not only were Republicans a little bit down after knowing that control of the Senate wouldn't be at stake, Raphael Warnock was able to present himself as something of a mainstream alternative. Uh, Herschel Walker, all the problems with his candidacy, his ties to former President Trump. Ultimately, Warnock was able to win a very big victory in a state that Democrats, frankly, weren't even competitive in just a few years ago. It is a big victory indeed. And remind our viewers why 51 seats in the Senate is such a big difference for Democrats than just having 50. Yeah, now that Georgia is done, we, we know officially that uh, that we're looking at that extra seat there, that 51st seat. Oh, look, it matters for a couple of reasons. First, the internal makings, makeup of the Senate. Every committee is now controlled uh, firmly by the Democrats. It means they can move subpoenas, they can move judicial nominations, even legislation to the floor without any Republicans getting on board. And then, if you've got something that you want to push on a party line vote, any one senator can't be the difference maker. We've talked a lot about so-called President Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, and even Bernie Sanders sometimes voting against the party. Well, any one of them can no longer hold up the majority by him or herself because you've got that 51st seat. And then as you look into the next election cycle, having that little bit of margin for error, knowing that the Democrats have to defend some very difficult seats in, 2020, in 2024, the fact that they've got that extra seat makes a big, big difference. Uh, as Chuck Schumer said today, uh, Democrats can, can, can exhale right now knowing they've got that additional seat coming. And in case you are already counting at home, we are 699 days until the 2024 presidential election, and the battleground map appears to have shifted slightly, Rick. Now states like Georgia and Arizona replacing longtime battlegrounds of Florida and Ohio. So how does this change the landscape, and how will candidates have to campaign differently? For the record, I'm not counting, but maybe I need to start. <laughs> and for as long as I've been covering politics, we've talked about places like Ohio and Florida as critical battlegrounds. They're huge, enormous. They do go in either direction, but not maybe anymore. This last election with the Senate races and the governor's races in both those states going so firmly to the Republicans may have cemented them as Republican states going forward. And yes, a new battleground map that includes places like Arizona and Georgia right now, I think, is inevitable. That's the new reality that campaigns are looking at. Uh, you can imagine a, a candidate like Joe Biden, if he runs for re-election in 2024, spending a lot more time and resources into Georgia and Arizona than in Ohio and Florida. In fact, his campaign, his, his White House, wants to change the primary calendar to put Georgia near the front of the line, very much aimed toward getting organized in a state that Democrats recognize is an opportunity for them, but where they, they need to have uh, an even stronger infrastructure. Big implications for the candidates and also for our correspondents who will be out covering this as well. Rick Klein, thank you so much as always for your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you. Overseas now to the sweeping raids across Germany where authorities say they foiled a suspected coup plot. Thousands of police and special forces made arrests over an alleged attempt to overthrow the government by right-wing extremists, many of them members of the military. Authorities say the plan was fueled by conspiracy theories about the, quote, deep state, and that those behind it had plans to attack Germany's parliament. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has the latest from Germany tonight. 
Tonight, a violent plot by far-right extremists influenced by QAnon ideology to overthrow the German government foiled, according to prosecutors. Some of those now reportedly under investigation, a former member of parliament, an active soldier and multiple reservists. Germany launching one of its biggest counter-terrorism operations in living memory. Heavily armed officers raiding over 130 properties across the country, arresting over two dozen suspects, including people in Italy and Austria. Prosecutors allege a network of armed, far-right extremists were planning to storm the German parliament. Their aim, to seize power. Tonight, prosecutors say this German aristocrat, a key figure in the alleged plot. They could have caused some real damage and killed people who are working there for our democracy. And that, I think, is very scary. Far-right extremists infiltrating key German institutions is a growing problem. The government here identifying more than 320 cases in just three years. Authorities allege this group also believes that Germany is controlled by a type of deep state. This alleged plot eerily similar to the January 6th insurrection. The uh, events in Germany uh, represent an alarming example of the danger facing democratic institutions across the globe. And Tom Sufi Burridge joining me now. And Tom, what are you learning tonight about the investigation? Ariel, one suspect arrested in the raids is a Russian national. Prosecutors say the group tried to contact Russian officials based here in Germany. The group allegedly planning to take over government ministries and create a new military organization, which it would then use to hold power after storming the parliament. Ariel? Tom Sufi Burridge reporting from Germany tonight. Thank you. Meanwhile, to our south, a constitutional crisis is playing out in Peru today. President Pedro Castillo was voted out and arrested after he attempted to dissolve Congress following his impeachment. The vice president, Dina Boluarte, sworn in amid the chaos, making her the first woman to become president in the South American nation. Her swearing in, capping off hours of uncertainty with Congress and the former president locked in an existential battle. Although Castillo is the first Peruvian president to be investigated while still in office, the probes are no surprise in a country where nearly every former president in the last 40 years has been charged with corruption. Back here at home, there is new information tonight in the investigation into the mysterious murders of four students at the University of Idaho. Police say they are looking for a vehicle spotted near the scene of the killings that morning. Let's get straight to ABC's Mola Lange. And Mola, what do we know about the car that police are searching for? Well, Ariel, late tonight, police announcing that they need the public's help in locating the occupants of a 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra, much like the one you see pictured right here. Now, they're interested in talking to those occupants, but right now, the license plate is unknown. The vehicle is believed to have been in the area of the residence where the four students were killed during the early morning hours of November 13th. Now, this comes as today, police removed the belongings, the students' belongings from the house, belongings that are no longer needed in the investigation. The items will be returned to their families and the police chief saying today, Ariel, that he hopes it will help with some of their healing. We could all hope so. Mola Lange, thank you so much. We shift to the triple-demic sweeping across this country, flu, COVID, and RSV. That triple threat once thought to mainly impact children and the elderly, now striking many other adults, too. And once again, our healthcare systems and providers are bearing the brunt. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Texas for us tonight. Tonight, health officials are warning that triple-demic of flu, RSV, and COVID is now hitting Americans of all ages. 80% of adult hospital beds are full, the highest peak since the Omicron surge. We are seeing high rates of flu, higher than we've seen this time of year in over a decade. COVID hospitalizations are surging too. The CDC director says Americans should consider masking and get their flu and COVID vaccines. I want to live to be 87 instead of 67. You know. So that's why I'm here getting my shots. And that triple whammy of viruses still straining pediatric hospitals like Cook Children's in Fort Worth, where bed space is scarce. Right now in our emergency room, we have patients who have been waiting for 12 plus hours to be seen. Our hospital is full, our ICU is full, and that is scary because we know that there are sick kids out there. The state of Nevada now fast-tracking licenses for nurses to handle a flood of pediatric patients. Lauren and Jason Taylor say they waited almost 24 
24 hours in the ER for an open hospital bed for their daughter, who was sick with RSV, pneumonia, and a collapsed lung. She had low oxygen, which they call hypoxia, and um, a fever, and they said that they needed to admit her right away. 18-month-old Kyra had just gotten over the flu when she had trouble breathing. You can see the belly going up. You can hear the forced breathing. You can see the ribs coming out, and they call this seesaw breathing. After four days in the hospital, Kyra's now home recovering. And Maria joins us now. And Maria, I want to ask you about the flu shot, about how many Americans have gotten this shot so far this season. We know, Ariel, right now we understand that just 40% of Americans have said that they are getting the flu shot or have gotten the flu shot. Health officials say they want to see that number much higher, but they do understand there is that vaccine fatigue. Still, they want to remind people that a perfect storm is brewing. They're, people are taking off their masks and also holiday travel is ramping up. So again, they stress it is very important to get the vaccines that are available right now. Ariel? And there's still time to reach that peak protection before Christmas. Maria, thank you so much. In China tonight, a dramatic rollback of its extreme zero COVID restrictions. It comes in the wake of mass protests, economic fallout, and U.S. businesses cutting ties. But those changes are also happening at the same time as a wave of new COVID infections. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, has the latest. Tonight, after years of extreme COVID lockdown, with shocking scenes like this of citizens pulled from their homes and forced into quarantine, China now easing COVID restrictions that prompted mass protests and plunged China's economy into dangerous territory. PCR tests will no longer be required for public transportation, airports or shopping centers in major cities. Asymptomatic citizens or those with mild symptoms can stay home instead of being sent to government facilities. And entire neighborhoods can no longer be locked down because of COVID positive cases. China's government announcing this move, claiming COVID is now less of a threat. But the economic pressures on the world's second largest economy clearly played a role. Major corporations concerned over supply chain and production issues, with Apple reportedly accelerating plans to move its iPhone production out of China. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, is the Chinese government using any vaccines manufactured here in the U.S.? They aren't, and not only do they have low vaccination rates, but their vaccines are less effective than ours. So doctors are warning there could be a wave of COVID deaths in the coming months in China. Uh, the U.S. has offered them our vaccines. President Xi has not accepted. Ariel? So much to keep an eye on, Martha Raditz. Thank you. When we come back, what uncovered a hidden piece of history buried on a beach for hundreds of years? And an inside look at how a documentary is chronicling the chaos and the challenges of the final nine months of America's war in Afghanistan. But first, it's no secret when you're using social media or browsing websites, your personal information is being collected. And that can mean info about your children, too. Laws have often been loosely enforced, but our Devin Dwyer looks at a congressional effort to impose national legislation and that potential impact. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Basically, my job is one of the cooler jobs we have here on the team. I get to feed everybody today. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com and ABC News on the Internet 24 hours a day. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is our commitment at ABC News to being America's most trusted news source. And so here's to celebrating 25 years of groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. Here's to everything ahead. Take a look at this. A discovery possibly hidden since the 1800s. A shipwreck unearthed by beach erosion caused by Hurricanes Ian and Nicole in central Florida. Archaeologists digging up the site say it's most likely a cargo or merchant ship which would have sailed near the coast and used lighthouses for navigation. The wreckage is estimated to be between 80 to 100 feet long. Experts say the boat probably sank during a similar storm to the ones that uncovered it. Protecting your privacy online, it can seem so hard these days. Tech and advertising companies, of course, collecting information about us as we browse. But what are the limits, especially when it comes to children? For decades, data privacy regulations have been a loosely enforced patchwork of laws. But now, for the first time, Congress is trying to advance comprehensive national regulations. Here's our Devin Dwyer with what it could mean for you and your family. Those are really nice pictures. Digital privacy advocate Jolena Quaresma is a single mom who, like millions of American parents, worries about her teenage daughter online. So after 24 hours, this is gone, right? Yeah. About how technology firms are tracking her and enticing her with targeted content. When I look at my screen time, it's a little bit like, wow, that's time that I could have been, you know, doing something else. Are you aware that, that, that these companies are picking up on where you're going and what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think one time I looked up like the word it for like whatever and I started getting horror movie ads and I was so freaked out. Like, he just could not take it. Data collection and targeted advertising are at the heart of how the Internet functions and how we experience it. But there's no comprehensive national standard for what companies can and cannot do. For years, sites like Facebook and Google have used third-party tracking technology that trails a user and builds a profile about their interests. Marketers then use that information to create targeted ads and promote content to keep users engaged. They're just collecting so much data on our kids. I mean, for one ad tech company, they will have collected over 70 million data points by the time a child is 13. She's 15 now. I don't even know where they're at. 70 million. Over 70 million. The more information you have on kids, the more you can do these hyper fine tuned algorithms, the more you can pull them towards more extreme ideas. Francis Haugen is a former Facebook insider and whistleblower who says the profiling of young users can be harmful and given the explosion of apps and time spent on devices is increasingly dangerous. Federal law requires websites to seek parental consent before they collect data on children under 13, but only if they have actual knowledge of a user's age. Congress hasn't updated the law in more than a decade, even as technologies have rapidly evolved.
privacy has serious consequences when it comes to kids. And I think it's, we're, we're long past due in terms of updating those laws. I'm a mom of uh, three young kids. Uh, this very much is on my, my heart every day as we're battling how much screen time in our household. Republican and Kathy McMorris-Rogers and Democrat Frank Pallone, who lead the House Energy and Commerce Committee, say they're advancing a historic plan to improve online privacy and better protect children and teens. And what makes it so urgent at this moment? I just think that the, uh, the situation has gotten completely out of hand. More screen time, more time online. That's been the goal, is just to keep us on our phones as much as possible. And for our kids, it's been, a, it's been especially harmful. The biggest problem right now, to me, is that there, there is no national standard. You can opt in or opt out, whatever. Uh, but people don't really understand that. The American Data Privacy and Protection Act would for the first time set a national standard, limiting data collection to only what's necessary for a company to maintain its service, creating a right to know what information has been collected about you and a right to sue if your privacy has been abused. It's going to empower the, the individual to have control over the, the data that's being collected and used and, and stored, but also then potentially sold. And most significant yeah. for parents, oh they God. say. Are you kidding me? Of course I follow her. The law would ban collection of sensitive data on children under 17 and end targeted advertising to anyone a company could reasonably assume to be a minor. If they could pass legislation where um, it gives everyone privacy, comprehensive federal privacy, that would be great. Social media and technology companies say they're on board, but only so long as a new law applies equally across the board. There are 15 different carve-outs and exceptions. What that means in practice is data privacy will mean one thing in one state, and a different thing in another state. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce also warns sharply curbing data collection will wreak havoc on the economy. We're really concerned that businesses, especially small businesses, won't be able to use data and digital advertising to reach customers. Uh, we had one small business tell us that if they lose the ability to do that, it's like another pandemic. The House bill has support from a top Senate Republican, but a key Senate Democrat who heads the committee overseeing privacy legislation is not yet on board. <laughs> Neither is outgoing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi of California. The House will be in order. Who worries a national law could override California's state privacy protections that took effect earlier this year. A Pelosi spokesman telling ABC News, unfortunately, changes are still needed to preserve states' ability to keep pace with rapidly changing technologies and platforms and to guarantee the same essential consumer protections in California's existing privacy laws. We have no idea who these people are. You're not doing that, right? No, mine okay. is just set to my friends. All right. Coresma, who works no, for a nonprofit no. backing the bill, says a compromise is desperately uh, needed. I'm a single mom, and I, <laughs> I love the fact that everything I'm doing is in an effort to make her life better. If we don't do it, then this continues and maybe people will start to think, well, there is no privacy and nobody's ever going to protect me and the government can't do anything about it. The government can do something about it and that's why we're doing this bill, Democrats and Republicans coming together. Optimistic it'll pass? Yes. It will be interesting to see how that plays out. Our thanks to Devin Dwyer. And still ahead here on Time, why a restaurant says it canceled a conservative group's event just moments before it started. The latest response from San Francisco lawmakers to the backlash over a measure allowing police to deploy robots capable of using deadly force. And we take a look at what's leading millions of millennials to move right back in with their parents by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Time Magazine names Ukrainian President Zelensky as its 2022 person of the year. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic.
There's so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. This was a terrible experience. To get master gaslighting us. The website fully crashed. Nightmare. It's all in wrong. Everything. This is really unprecedented. <laughs> all of these things were preventable. Does any part of you blame Taylor? Ticketmaster or whomever else has to figure out how to solve this before Beyonce announces her tour. Taylor's Ticketmaster disaster. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Zoo. 200. Oh, 200. 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Like a boomerang, a new survey shows many millennials are moving back in with their parents. Let's take a look by the numbers. About one in four millennials are living with their parents. That's according to a survey conducted for propertymanagement.com. That's equal to about 18 million people between the ages of 26 to 41, and 55% of them say that they made that move in the past year. So what's driving this? Well, more than 50% of those surveyed said that it was to save money as inflation has eaten into paychecks, while 39% said that they couldn't afford soaring rent. Around 91% said that they would likely move out if they had higher income, and about 15% of millennials say that they're spending more than half of their salary on rent. But commitment to family was also a key factor for moving back home. Roughly 31% said that they moved in with their parents to take care of them, while 30% said that they simply just liked living with them. And this isn't necessarily failure, failure to launch, 38% of those living at home said that their parents charge them rent, but nearly half of them said that they pay less than $500 a month. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime, the frightening on-air moments when an announcer suffered a medical emergency. And Google reveals its most searched terms, news events, and celebrities. But first, a look at your top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. Experience. To get master gaslighting us. The website fully crashed. Nightmare. Ah! It's all in wrong. Everything? This is really unprecedented. <laughs> all of these things were preventable. Does any part of you blame Taylor? Ticketmaster or whomever else has to figure out how to solve this before Beyonce announces her tour. Taylor's Ticketmaster disaster. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. 
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A major victory in Georgia for Democratic incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock. You got me for six more years. The Atlanta pastor's win in the red state hands Democrats an outright majority in the Senate, making it easier for the party to confirm judges and advance legislation out of committees. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer crediting voters who backed Democrats over candidates endorsed by former President Trump. He pointed to the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe versus Wade and the January 6th attack on the Capitol as reasons Americans came out to vote for Democrats. Another former executive for Theranos has been sentenced to prison time. Sonny Balwani, the business partner and ex-boyfriend of founder Elizabeth Holmes, was sentenced to nearly 13 years in prison. Balwani served as the company's COO. Prosecutors said he was an equal participant in hiding the truth about Theranos' technology and its capacity to test for diseases with only a few drops of blood. Holmes was sentenced to more than 11 years in prison for her role in the fraud three weeks ago. San Francisco is reversing a plan that would have allowed police to use robots for lethal force. On a final vote, the board doing a 180, deciding unanimously to ban the use of police robots strapped with a deadly weapon or a bomb and have sent the proposal back to a committee for more discussion. There was outrage in the city when approval was given. Police said killing a suspect using a robot would be a last extreme resort and that they don't even have any robots that are equipped that way. Some supervisors said the public did not have enough time to weigh in. A conservative Christian advocacy group from Virginia claims a restaurant turned them away due to their religious beliefs. The Family Foundation says it was told shortly before its scheduled event at Metzger Bar and Butchery in Richmond last week that the restaurant was canceling. In a statement, Metzger Bar and Butchery said it refused to serve the group when the restaurant found the members were donors for an organization that it claimed seeks to deprive women and LGBTQ plus persons of their basic human rights in Virginia. The restaurant said it would deny service to anyone that made its staff feel uncomfortable or unsafe, pointing out that many of its staff members were women and or members of the LGBTQ plus community. The Family Foundation told ABC station WRIC it would be open to a discussion with the restaurant. A terrifying moment on air. Atlanta Hawks announcer Bob Rathbun suffering a medical emergency during pregame coverage of Monday's Hawks Thunder matchup. 68 year old live courtside with broadcast partner Dominique Wilkins first appearing disoriented, falling back into his chair, then losing consciousness and starting to convulse. Medical professionals already at the game then rushing to Rathbun's side, saying they treated him for dehydration and took him to an Atlanta hospital. Valley Sports Southeast saying in a statement, test results were very favorable, adding that Bob is in great spirits. If at any point this year you did a Google search about Wordle, you're hardly alone. The search engine released its top searches for 2022, with the mobile game that went viral taking the top spot both globally and in the U.S. for the most searches over the year. Other top searches on both lists included Ukraine and the recently passed Queen Elizabeth, which were also the top two most searched news events this year. Also of apparent interest, the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard defamation trial. Depp was the most searched person on the global list, with Heard taking the third spot. And the Oscars incident between Will Smith and Chris Rock also seemed to resonate. Both men appeared in the top five globally. 
A team working for former President Trump has uncovered at least two more documents marked classified in a storage unit owned by the federal government. Let's bring in ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, for more on this. And Pierre, a federal judge had pressed the Trump team to just keep looking after that August Mar-a-Lago raid to make sure all classified documents had been returned. So what did they find? Earl, it's been months since that raid, and they're still finding classified documents from the Trump presidency. Sources telling ABC News at least two additional documents marked classified were recently discovered at a government storage facility not far from Mar-a-Lago. This after hundreds had been recovered from former President Trump's Florida home last August. Sources tell us Trump's team found the documents after a federal judge privately told Trump's attorney to carefully search for more to make sure there were no other classified documents at any other properties associated with Trump. Ariel, the significance of these documents is not clear, but this is the stunning thing. The discovery raises the prospect there could be more classified documents out there. Stunning indeed, Pierre Thomas. Thank you so much. And next tonight, to the so-called rogue wave hitting a cruise ship, killing an American passenger. It happened near Antarctica. ABC's Gio Benitez gives us an exclusive interview with a couple who was on board that ship. New details emerging about a harrowing tale at sea. It was going real smoothly, and we were only anticipating nothing but smooth going forward. Tom and Pam Trustdale were on a bucket list trip to Antarctica last week when their trip of a lifetime turned into a deadly disaster. Not only was their boat, the Viking Polaris, slammed by a killer rogue wave, ABC News now confirming just one day before, a fellow passenger was seriously injured during a Zodiac boat excursion. The Trustdales were on the boat too. The passenger across from me said, oh look, there's penguins jumping out of the water. And that's when the explosion occurred. Pam recording the tense moments on her phone as she and fellow passengers were thrown into the air. It was a real loud, it was a boom. And I flew up in the air and the passenger across from me flew up in the air. She came down and hit hard. I hurt my leg though. <laughs> I can't move mine. I saw the woman go probably about three feet in the air and then the gentleman straight across from me go up in the air and then roll over into the sea. So I went across and leaned over the pontoon and I just grabbed on to the life jacket. He was face up, so he was stabilized and I reassured him that, hey, you're safe. Tom and another passenger were able to quickly pull the man back onto the Zodiac boat, the woman's legs severely injured. Oh, okay. She said, I, I, I hurt my leg. She said, I can't feel my leg. And then I could hear her kind of straining that, you know, I could tell that she was in a lot of pain. The passenger's leg requiring surgery, leading the ship's captain to turn back to Argentina immediately through the treacherous Drake Passage, known as one of the most turbulent stretches of ocean in the world. The water's rough. Around 10.30 p.m. the next night, a rogue wave crashed into the Polaris, killing one passenger, Sherry Zhu, and injuring four others. This wave hit it and came over and literally broke through windows and just washed into these rooms. And not only did it wash into the rooms, but it, it broke walls down and one, some walls went into the next room. You can see that there were windows out on about I don't know, somewhere around six of the rooms, six, six or eight, six or eight in varying degrees. Viking saying in a statement it is investigating the rogue wave incident and committed to the safety and security of all guests and crew. What a terrifying incident. Our thanks to Geo for that report. And now to Apple facing a lawsuit over its AirTag devices. Two women claiming it put their safety at risk. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has the story. Two women are hitting Apple with a proposed class action lawsuit, alleging the tech company's AirTag tracking device makes it easier for stalkers. It was just truly terrifying. Lauren Hughes and another woman who's suing as Jane Doe claim that their former partners used AirTags hidden in their cars to track their whereabouts without their knowledge. Hughes says she believes her ex placed the device she found on her wheel in order to track, harass, and threaten her. He had been leaving things at my door, so I made the decision to move to a new place. Uh, during that process, I was actually loading things 
into my vehicle at the time when I got the notification that um, an AirTag was moving with me. The lawsuit alleges Apple's device circumvents security features without taking reasonable steps to ensure that the monitoring products and services will be used only for legitimate and lawful purposes. There is some evidence out there that Apple has had issues with the product and has made some efforts to improve its safety protocols, but that, according to these women and this lawsuit, those efforts were not sufficient. Hughes and the Jane Doe are not the only ones who say devices like this have been used against them. A California woman says after a shopping trip, she and a friend were alerted to a tag following them. There was a map that showed it followed our exact location from Target all the way back to her house. And earlier this year, Sports Illustrated swimsuit model Brooks Nader made headlines when she said she was tracked through New York City, suspecting the tag was placed in her coat when she wasn't looking. I was already on my walk home, halfway home. I got the notification that was like, someone's tracking you and has been for a while. It was the scariest, scariest moment ever. Our thanks to Rebecca. The documentary Retrograde chronicles the final nine months of America's 20-year war in Afghanistan from multiple perspectives. The film capturing the chaos and the complexity from rarely seen operational control rooms to the front lines of battle to the chaotic Kabul airport during the final U.S. withdrawal. It also paints a vivid portrait of the war's impact on the people of Afghanistan. Let's take a look. I want to live long enough to see peace in our country spend time with my family, grow old in Afghanistan, and ultimately die in Afghanistan. ABC's Phil Lipoff had a chance to sit down with Academy Award nominated and Emmy Award winning director Matthew Heineman, the filmmaker behind Retrograde. Here's their conversation. You come at this from three different perspectives, from one of the last U.S. units deployed uh, from an Afghan general and from civilians desperately trying to get away from this as it's happening and after it's happening. Um, you could have, in your st storytelling, followed just one of them, and it would have been riveting, and you would have been able to tell the story. Why did you choose to follow it from three different perspectives? So the, the journey of this film actually started several years ago um, with this sort of somewhat cliched idea of trying to uh, document a deployment from both the soldiers' perspective and their families back home. By the time we actually deployed, it was January 2021, and it became clear that, look, actually maybe we can tell this story about the end of the war in Afghanistan, the longest war in U.S. history, through the prism of this deployment. The Americans trained me, and after being committed for so many years, I just don't believe that the Americans are going to retrograde and leave the country. And so we sort of, that was our initial pivot. Um, and then, you know, three or so months into filming, President Biden obviously pulled out our troops. Green Braves went home. And it just felt like, you know, we had the beginning of a story, we had the first act of a story, but clearly this story was not over. And so we reached back out to General Sami Sadat, who's in charge of Helmand Province in southern Afghanistan. He had been working with the Green Berets. So it was a natural sort of extension of what we had already started. You know, at times it was terrifying, at times it was exhilarating, at times it was sad. I mean, you know, to some degree the narrative tension of the film is every neon sign metaphorically was saying, stop, give up, surrender, this is over. And General Sadat had this unwavering belief in himself and his men that maybe, just maybe, if they held on to Helmand or Lashkar or southern Afghanistan, that the country could hold together. Talk a little bit about the emotions of, of these U.S. soldiers as this was happening, because you saw it all. I mean, I think there, there's a real motif in the film of, of holding on faces and letting faces speak more than words can ever speak. You know, faces never lie. A face, I think, is a window into the soul. And we're in the room, literally, as, as Biden announces on TV that he's pulling out the troops. And they're, you know, their faces speak more than words could ever speak. And, you know, there's a subsequent scene afterwards as they tell their Afghan counter counterparts that they're leaving. Many of them had worked for years alongside these Afghans and, you know, their friends, they're, they shed blood together, they lost friends together. So, there, you know, there's a real sense of abandonment. How about the, the civilians? The U.S. soldiers feel one way. What did the Afghan people feel? So we were prepared to go back to sort of film this, this final chapter, this final battle with the Taliban. And 
by the time we got to Dubai, things started to fall quite rapidly. And the door that this opened was, was sort of widening the aperture of the storytelling to show the civilians that the Green Braves had been fighting for, to show the civilians that um, General Sadat and his men had been fighting for. We, we started to film at the gates. We decided to leave the airport, go outside the wire, not knowing whether we'd be able to come back or whether we'd be able to get on a flight. I just felt like it was really important to, to see both the city under Taliban rule and see these gates and the desperation of the civilians trying to get in and leave. What was that like to shoot in the middle of what really was chaos? Nobody knew what was going to happen next. It was some of the hardest, it was definitely the hardest few days of shooting in my, my career. That scene at the Abbey Gate with thousands of Afghan civilians, American partners, NATO partners, packed like sardines in a four-foot sewage ditch, desperately trying to flee as these 18-year-old Marines were making these impossible Sophie's Choice decisions on who to let in and who not to let in. These Marines, many of whom weren't even alive uh, when, I, when the Twin sad. Towers fell. As the Taliban was watching us at gunpoint 100 yards away, as ISIS was circling around in suicide vests waiting to attack, which happened in that very same spot 12 hours later. It just was surreal. Where were you when that bomb went off? We were just leaving uh, when, when it went off. Are we, do you know Ian Panel? I well, saw I saw Ian. You saw Ian there? Yeah. These are just devastating, heartbreaking scenes here. The reporting that he did, seeing those Sophie's Choice decisions, the chaos watching from back here, and not just as a journalist, but watching as an American, was hard to was hard to comprehend that something that we've been involved in for twenty years could end like this. I think a lot of people were thinking that. This film in all my films really they're not an attempt to articulate or dissect what went wrong or who's at fault or how we got here or where we're going. It's trying to put a human face to this, you know, headline that we were plastered with. And, you know, I think our world is so divided. We live in these echo chambers. And to me, the value of documentary film is to instigate conversation, is to create dialogue, is to allow people from all different sides of the political spectrum to come and argue and debate and to feel and to care. You talk about uh, being emotional. Is there one image that stands out in your mind? I mean, I think my mind is, is filled with probably hundreds or thousands of images, um, many of which I dream about at night. Um, I mean, these, these films change you, right? These experiences change you. Um, they certainly have changed me. And I suffer from PTSD. I've you know, anxiety and nightmares. Um, it's not something I'm ashamed of. I think it's important to talk about. That's on one hand. On the other hand, I'm extraordinarily privileged. I have a blue passport. I get to come back. I get to sit here and talk in Manhattan in a studio with you, and that's, that's privilege, you know? It seems like we've forgotten about the war in Afghanistan. And yeah, amongst many goals, I hope that retrograde um, reignites a conversation around these people that we left behind, this country that we left behind. Our thanks to Phil and Matthew for that important conversation. Retrograde premieres on National Geographic tomorrow and will be available to stream on Disney Plus and Hulu this weekend. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Meet Jonathan the tortoise. He's lived through two world wars, 40 U.S. presidents, and eight British monarchs. He was alive when the first phone call was ever placed. He was even alive when the first picture was taken. Jonathan, who lives on St. Helena, just celebrated his 190th birthday, although he could be older. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, he is the oldest tortoise in the world. Doesn't look a day over 189. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Ariel Reshef. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in our next hour, hurricane season may be over, but don't tell that to Mother Nature. And you may have seen these AI photos taking over your social media feeds, but do they pose a security risk? This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Good evening, I'm Ariel Reshef, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A rare December tropical disturbance is taking shape in the Atlantic. The National Hurricane Center is tracking what could possibly become December's first subtropical storm in nearly a decade. The system is thankfully far out to sea and with no danger of landfall. November 30th traditionally marks the end of hurricane season. As a nation, we have said never again, yet it proceeds to happen time and time again at schools, shopping centers, concerts, and places of worship. Gun violence. A week from today marks 10 years since the Sandy Hook massacre, and earlier President Biden joined survivors and families at the 10th annual National Vigil for the Victims of Gun Violence. Events like this are hard. They're hard for all of you because it brings back the very moment that everything happened. But your voices matter. Your voices matter a great deal. According to the Gun Violence Archive, more than 19,000 people have died and 39,000 have been injured as a result of gun violence in the U.S. this year alone. And a handful of centenarian survivors of the attack on Pearl Harbor joined thousands at the scene of the Japanese bombing to commemorate those who died 81 years ago today. The crowd observing a moment of silence at the same time the attack began on December 7th, 1941. About 2,400 servicemen were killed in that bombing, which launched the U.S. into World War II. Now to the final results of the midterms in the, in the Georgia State Senate runoff with incumbent Raphael Warnock defeating Republican challenger Herschel Walker, Democrats hailing that victory and many now wondering what this means for former President Trump's influence in the Republican Party after another disappointment in this year's midterms. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott reporting tonight from Capitol Hill. Senator, how are you feeling? Good, how are you? Senator Raphael Warnock arriving back in Washington today. After voters in Georgia sent a clear message. It, it is my honor to utter the four most powerful words ever spoken in a democracy. The people have spoken. Democrats taking a victory lap. Georgia did it again. After one year, 10 months, and 17 days of the longest 50-50 Senate in history, 51, yeah. a slim majority. That is great, and we are so happy about it. President Biden, now the first Democratic president in nearly 90 years, the first since FDR, whose party did not lose a single Senate seat in a midterm election. Congratulations, buddy. 
Thank you. Thank you. Go we'll get them. Make it easier for us to get some things done. You sure I will. I guarantee you it will. For Republicans, Herschel Walker's loss, a bitter pill to swallow. And I'm not going to make any excuses now because we put up one heck of a fight. Walker underperformed in Georgia's Republican strongholds. His campaign plagued with one scandal after another. The football legend, the hand-picked choice of former President Donald Trump. Trump endorsed Senate candidates in Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Arizona, and Nevada all went down in defeat this year. Republican leaders increasingly frustrated. In the election year when it should have been a referendum on the current administration, their policies, uh, the Democrats in many cases were able to kind of turn it into a choice election because of, of uh, Trump's presence out there. So, uh, you know, was he a factor? Um, I don't think there's any question about that. Despite loss after loss for his candidates, Trump is now doubling down on the fringe having dinner with anti-Semitic rapper Kanye West and white supremacist Nick Fuentes, even calling for parts of the Constitution to be terminated to overturn the 2020 election. And now ABC has learned that just last night, Trump welcomed some followers of the QAnon conspiracy theory to Mar-a-Lago. You are incredible people. To some Republicans, it all spells one thing. And I know a lot of people in our party uh, love the president, former president, but he said, uh, if you will, the kiss of death for somebody who wants to win a general election. ABC congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins me now. And Rachel, earlier this year, we heard Republican leader Mitch McConnell warn about candidate quality, and that does seem to have been a major factor in this final defeat for Republicans. It really does, Ariel, especially the way that you look at the way that these midterm election losses for Republicans are just stacking up here, especially when it comes to the ones that former President Donald Trump endorsed, including Herschel Walker. And I got to tell you, I've spent a lot of time traveling this country, uh, covering this midterm election cycle, just got back from Georgia, and the voters that I spoke to, even voters that voted for the Republican governor, Brian Kemp, told me that they just could not vote for Herschel Walker. They said, repeating those words from McConnell, that this all came down to candidate quality for them. Ariel? Tracking it all for us. Rachel Scott, thank you so much. Next to a Supreme Court case some say is an unprecedented bid to upend election laws and give state legislatures nearly unchecked power to dictate when, where, and how Americans vote for president and for Congress. North Carolina Republicans want the high court to bar the state's Supreme Court from the ability to review state election laws and, in the process, reinstate a gerrymandered election map drawn by the state legislature. During the three hours of arguments, a majority of the justices appeared skeptical of entirely removing the state courts from the process of reviewing state election laws, but a majority did seem willing to impose new limits on the role judges can play in election policy. Now to the sweeping raids across Germany, where authorities say they foiled a suspected coup plot. Thousands of police and special forces made arrests over an alleged attempt to overthrow the government by right-wing extremists, many of them members of the military. Authorities say the plot was fueled by conspiracy theories about the, quote, deep state, and that those behind it had plans to attack Germany's parliament. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has the latest from Germany tonight. Tonight, a violent plot by far-right extremists influenced by QAnon ideology to overthrow the German government foiled, according to prosecutors. Some of those now reportedly under investigation, a former member of parliament, an active soldier and multiple reservists. Germany launching one of its biggest counter-terrorism operations in living memory. Heavily armed officers raiding over 130 properties across the country, arresting over two dozen suspects, including people in Italy and Austria. Prosecutors allege a network of armed, far-right extremists were planning to storm the German parliament. Their aim, to seize power. Tonight, prosecutors say this German aristocrat, a key figure in the alleged plot. They could have caused some real damage and killed people who are working there for our democracy, and that, I think, is very scary. Far-right extremists infiltrating key German institutions is a growing problem. The government here identifying more than 320 cases in just three years. Authorities allege this group also believes that Germany is controlled by a type of deep state. This alleged plot eerily similar to the January 6th insurrection. The uh, events in Germany uh, represent an alarming example of the danger facing democratic institutions across the globe. 
concerning developments there. Our thanks to Tom Sufiberg in Germany for that. We shift to the triple demic sweeping across this country. Flu, COVID, and RSV, the triple threat once again, or once thought to be mainly impacting children and the elderly, now striking other adults too. And once again, our healthcare systems and providers are bearing the brunt of this. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Texas for us tonight. Tonight, health officials are warning that triple-demic of flu, RSV, and COVID is now hitting Americans of all ages. 80% of adult hospital beds are full, the highest peak since the Omicron surge. We are seeing high rates of flu, higher than we've seen this time of year in over a decade. COVID hospitalizations are surging too. The CDC director says Americans should consider masking and get their flu and COVID vaccines. I want to live to be 87 instead of 67, you know. So that's why I'm here getting my shots. And that triple whammy of viruses still straining pediatric hospitals like Cook Children's in Fort Worth, where bed space is scarce. Right now in our emergency room, we have patients who have been waiting for 12 plus hours to be seen. Our hospital is full, our ICU is full, and that is scary because we know that there are sick kids out there. The state of Nevada now fast tracking licenses for nurses to handle a flood of pediatric patients. Lauren and Jason Taylor say they waited almost 20 four hours in the ER for an open hospital bed for their daughter who was sick with RSV, pneumonia and a collapsed lung. She had low oxygen, which they call hypoxia and um, a fever and they said that they needed to admit her right away. 18 month old Kyra had just gotten over the flu when she had trouble breathing. You can see the belly going up. You can hear the forced breathing. You can see the ribs coming out and they call this seesaw breathing. After four days in the hospital, Kyra's now home recovering. And Maria joins us now. And Maria, I want to ask you about the flu shot, about how many Americans have gotten this shot so far this season. We know, Ariel, right now we understand that just 40% of Americans have said that they are getting the flu shot or have gotten the flu shot. Health officials say they want to see that number much higher, but they do understand there is that vaccine fatigue. Still, they want to remind people that a perfect storm is brewing. They're, people are taking off their masks and also holiday travel is ramping up. So again, they stress it is very important to get the vaccines that are available right now. Ariel? And there's still time to reach that peak protection before Christmas. Maria, thank you so much. A judge has sentenced Sonny Balwani, the former business partner and ex-boyfriend of Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes, to nearly 13 years in prison for fraud. Theranos was a startup that promised to create technology capable of testing for hundreds of diseases using only a few drops of blood. Three weeks ago, Holmes was sentenced to more than 11 years behind bars. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has been following this case from the very beginning. Rebecca, why did Balwani receive a longer sentence than Holmes and what can we expect happens next? Well, Ariel, he was convicted on more counts than she was. 12 counts for him, four counts for her. And in particular, the counts that he was convicted on that she was not were patient counts that linked him directly to patients who were misinformed about their health because of invalid Theranos tests. He ran the lab and oversaw that. And as a result, he got a greater sentence than she did, but not by much. She sentenced three weeks ago, got about 11 years in prison. He got 13 years behind bars. Next step is for him to report to surrender. That comes in March of next year, but his team, his legal team said in court today that they will appeal this decision. Meantime, Elizabeth Holmes team is appealing her decision and trying to keep her out of jail while that process is underway. Ariel, a lot of eyes on that appeals process. Rebecca Jarvis for us. Thank you so much. Now to new developments on that power grid sabotage in North Carolina. Investigators say they found shell casings at the scene of two damaged substations, and now there's a $75,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi has the latest. Tonight, a law enforcement source investigating the attack on two electrical substations in Moore County, North Carolina, tells ABC News federal search warrants have been filed but they did not say whether they were related to a person or people local to the area. The development comes as investigators tell ABC News they recovered shell casings at two sites located about 13 miles apart on either side of Moore County. I think we're just days and moments and hours away from catching the culprit that did this tragedy. The FBI releasing this new poster asking the public for help. Officials announcing a $75,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. 
Every investigator working on this case, state, local, and federal, know what you want, and that's answers. And Mona Kosar Abdi joins us now from Moore County, North Carolina. And Mona, so many people wondering when this power will be fully restored. What are officials saying tonight? Well, Ariel, good news. Duke Energy says they're just about finished restoring power, and they expect to be done by tonight. Right now, roughly 1,200 households remain. The curfew will be lifted tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., and schools will reopen Friday. Ariel? Such good news. Mona, on the ground there for us. Thank you so much. Next to the unsettled weather across much of the country, we are tracking several storm systems tonight from California to Texas to the Northeast. Let's get straight to ABC's senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Hey, Rob. Hi, Ariel. You're right. It is unsettled, but also a very messy weather pattern. A lot of players on the map tonight will go over the big weather makers. You got this one in the midsection of the country. It's a two headed sprawling storm that's going to push more rounds of rain and thunderstorms across the already saturated mid south. So Arkansas across the Mississippi and through the Tennessee Valley you could see some flooding issues north of this. So we're looking at the Midwest seeing some snows so that's spread across the Great Lakes as well. I think mostly north of Chicago and we're talking about just a few inches, but enough to slick up the roadways there. And this system could bring a little bit of snow to the northeast as well over the weekend. Another system coming into the west and then another one after that over the weekend. This one looks really powerful and consolidated, but it'll really hit everybody on the west coast from Seattle, Portland, all the way down to San Francisco and San Diego. Heavy rain, wind, mountain snow getting into the Sierra as well. We're talking about maybe two to five feet of snow. That'll probably trigger some avalanche warnings, but it is building a nice snow base in an area that has a significant drought. So we'll take that. The bad news is this storm will be strong enough to get over the rock and really affect most of everybody in the eastern half of the country well into next week. Ariel. Hopefully at least some good skiing out west. Rob, thank you. Next to the artificial photos taking over social media that are transforming your pictures. I'm sure you've seen them. They're like avatars, but the question many people are asking now, are these images on this app safe to share? Gio Benitez has more. It's the app that's taken social media by storm, from celebrities to TikTokers, all putting their face through the Lenza AI app. Everybody's using their the AI-generated images from these in their social media apps. Oh, I love being a woman. It's just really taken off in uh, the past uh, couple of weeks. While the app is just taking off, it's actually been around since 2018. You upload 10 to 20 photos of your face. Think selfies or portraits. The more angles and face expressions the photos have, the better results you can achieve. Then, after about half an hour, Lenza generates dozens, even hundreds, of pieces of digital art called magic avatars. But this morning, the question, how safe is your data when you use it? Andrew Kautz is senior editor of security at Wired. The company does claim to delete uh, quote unquote face data after 24 hours, uh, and they seem to have uh, good policies in place for their privacy and security practices. But he isn't too concerned about the photos. He says most of us already have our face online on social media, but. The main thing I would be concerned about is uh, the behavioral uh, analytics that they're collecting. If I were going to use the app, I would make sure to turn on as restrictive uh, privacy settings as possible. And he has some advice no matter which app you have on your phone. You can change your privacy settings on uh, your phone to make sure that the app isn't collecting as much data as uh, it seems to be able to. And you can make sure that you're not sharing images that contain anything more private than just your face. Some good advice there. Our thanks to Gio for that. And still to come, the constitutional crisis unfolding in Peru. The president arrested, accused of plotting a coup. And our conversation with the Russian activist who fled her country. She's now on the Kremlin's wanted list. Why she's speaking out. This was a terrible experience. To get master gaslighting. It's the website fully crashed. Nightmare. It's all in wrong. Everything. This is really unprecedented. <laughs> all of these things were preventable. Does any part of you blame Taylor? Ticketmaster or whomever else has to figure out how to solve this before Beyonce announces her tour. Taylor's Ticketmaster disaster. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. We are tracking several headlines around the world. A constitutional crisis in Peru today. President Pedro Castillo was voted out and arrested after he attempted to dissolve Congress following his impeachment. The vice president, Dina Boluarte, sworn in, sworn in amid the chaos, making her the first woman to become president in the South American nation. Her swearing in capped hours of uncertainty with Congress and the former president locked in an existential battle. Although Castillo is the first Peruvian president to be investigated while still in office, the probes are no surprise in a country where nearly every former president in the last 40 years has been charged with corruption. The bomb maker behind the blast that killed more than 200 people two decades ago in Bali has been released on parole. The bomber, a member of an Al-Qaeda-linked group, was jailed for 20 years after he was found guilty of constructing explosives that ripped through two nightclubs. As part of his release, he is required to join a, quote, mentoring program until April of 2030. The faces of 108 Nigerian girls who are still missing eight years after they were kidnapped by the terrorist group Boko Haram have been sculpted in clay, as you can see here, in a collaboration between an artist, a group of potters, and university students. The artwork, titled Statues Also Breathe, consists of 108 life-size clay figures made by students from all over Nigeria. It is now on display at an art gallery in Lagos. She was sentenced to two years of house arrest for her work with the Open Russia movement, causing her to miss the final days of her dying daughter's life. In a new documentary, civil rights activist Anastasia, Anastasia Shevchenko chronicles her journey to spread her daughter's ashes and to build a new life for her other children outside of Russia. ABC Stephanie Ramos spoke to her about her activism, her family, and her hope for the future. So the documentary is centered around the fallout from your work with the open Russian movement, work that eventually led you to spending house arrest uh, for two years. What was that like for you? Well, first of all, um, why I was under house arrest during two years, just because I took part in a protest against Putin. They put me under house arrest without possibility to communicate with anyone. Uh, I couldn't uh, leave the apartment, just staying all time at home, no internet, no no communication, no phone calls, just nothing. I was separated from my elder daughter who died uh, a week after the house arrest. And uh, it was, uh, I, I can't even describe it, how difficult it was, because I was standing in front of judge during the hearing and begging him, please let me see my daughter, she is dying in the hospital right now and she needs me, she really needs me. And uh, he just smiled and that's it. And uh, only two days after um, they let me go to the hospital and see her, but uh, 
It was just an hour before she died. Находившаяся под домашним арестом. Шевченко узнала, что Алина стала критическим. Адвокаты обратились к следователю, чтобы матери разрешили съездить в интернат. They let me see her like for 10 minutes, and I took her hand, and it was cold, like there was no life uh, in her body anymore. In a couple of hours, when I went home, and the investigator came and asked me to write a permission to attend my daughter's funeral. And I had to um, write every detail, uh, where I am going, what I am going to do there, what car is going to drive me there and back. Uh, and uh, of course, nobody could come up to me and say something or hug, just uh, me standing there alone. This dictatorship makes so many people suffer. And I feel like this film Anastasia is uh, not about me as mom grieving about the death of her child, but this is about my daughter. And my mission is to tell her story. Looking back at your decisions to speak out against the Russian government, would you do it again? What are your thoughts now so many years later? I was asking this question to myself like hundreds of times. I decided that I won't respect myself and my children won't respect me if I just do nothing. So I don't think that was a mistake. I protest against Putin, uh, even li living abroad. And um, I, I, I risk any time I say something against him, I do risk, but I need to do it, just in memory of my daughter. We see, we see in the film your, your journey to, to say a final goodbye to her, spreading her ashes in the sea. Talk a little bit about that, and what was that like for you to, to do, be able to do that with your family? That was a very tough decision because, um, I mean, not to say goodbye, but to say goodbye in front of cameras. We all wanted it to be a private moment for, only for our family. I really convinced them that it can be important to tell her story, to show people how Russians are resisting this regime, how it's actually dangerous. For me, it was really a special moment to scatter the ashes in the sea. It was so... Uh, such a moment when I felt like it was just my daughter and me, and that's it. How's the rest of your family handling this change, living abroad, and also the, the passing of Alina and everything that you guys have been through? Well, after the war began, we decided to leave Russia. We had chosen Lithuania because it's very close to Russia, you know, the same time zone. And uh, my son now is studying in a Russian-speaking school, and my daughter is studying politics. <laughs> But imagine uh, there are so many students from Belarus and Ukraine and Russia, and all of them fled because of one dictator. And uh, some families uh, and um, their houses are ruined, their parents are imprisoned. So many sufferings just because of this dictatorship. You end the documentary very optimistic, saying you believe your children would be the generation to end this oppression. Are you still that hopeful? Uh, you know, uh, sometimes I sound naive, yeah, and very optimistic, but that's the only thing that I have, hope. And um, I think Rush, uh, Russian President Putin, the only thing he wants to destroy uh, inside you, repressing you, is your hope. If you stop hoping, then you will stop struggling and fighting. You know? There is always hope. And our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that reporting. The documentary is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. And still to come, the dog that ran away and swam across one of the world's busiest waterways and lived to tell the tale. Terrible experience. Ticketmaster gaslighting us. The website fully crashed. Nightmare. Ah! It's all went wrong. Everything. This is really unprecedented. <laughs> all of these things were preventable. Does any part of you blame Taylor? Ticketmaster or whomever else has to figure out how to solve this before Beyonce announces her tour.
Taylor's Ticketmaster Disaster, Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Late last night, after 54 years of production, the final Boeing 747 rolled out of the manufacturing hangar in Everett, Washington. The 747 is the most iconic and recognizable aircraft in the world, and the first flew for Pan Am in 1970. But with the rapid shift in technology and the ability to fly nearly as many people on two engines versus four, the 747 is just no longer practical for most commercial passenger airlines. This last 747 will serve as a cargo plane out to greener pastures. A dramatic rescue took place at the Hudson River that stretches half a mile wide. A runaway dog, a service dog somehow managed to swim all the way across. ABC's Will Gans has the details. Most bears are known for hibernating in the winter. But not this one. Never expected to see him again. Never expected to even be telling this story. My, my son is like, you know, next time make up a story that's a little bit more believable. <laughs> you can believe it. Bear went on a solo adventure from New York City to New Jersey after getting loose on Saturday. I thought he was gone for good. We were so upset. We were devastated this weekend. We didn't know what to do. The 50-pound pup running a mile and a half north before jumping into the Hudson River and swimming all the way to New Jersey. Just after midnight on Tuesday, firefighters in Edgewater, New Jersey, responding to the call of a dog barking down by the water. How long have you been on today? The two guys in the water just stayed behind him so he would come towards, towards the boat. And he sat there, waited patiently. We, I grabbed him by the back of the head and put him in the boat. Firefighter Tom Quentin feeding bears some hard-earned treats. You gonna eat my whole bag of treats? It makes you feel good. I mean, especially when that we went back a second time to look for him. Um, it, it does make you feel good. Bear is a Leonberger Bernese Mountain Dog mix, so swimming is in his DNA. Plus, he hails from Montana, so it's no wonder he felt comfy on an outdoor adventure all by himself. He's doing great. You would never know that he had this adventure. He's fantastic. Ellen Wolpen only adopted Bear last Tuesday as a service dog for her son who has special needs. He's given us a lifetime of happiness with this. <laughs> yep. I say the dog is a fighter and so is my son, so they're a great combination. A rough commute for that little pup, but glad to see he's doing okay. That's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Ariel Reshef. Thanks for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight.